Hi, it's Teardown Tuesday again. Today, we've got one of these PER sensors or passive infrared or sometimes known as pyroelectric sensors. You've seen them before. They've used it, they're used in uh, home alarms and they sit up in the corner of your room and whenever somebody walks into the room, the red light flashes and if your uh, house alarm's armed, then it triggers the alarm. And they're basically, they are movement sensors, although what they're detecting, they are detecting movement, but they're also detecting heat as well, in particular body heat. So it's not just humans that uh, set them off, it's pets and things like that as well. And they're rather clever little things, so there's not much circuitry in them. So I thought I'd tear one down, reverse engineer it, see what's inside and play around with it a bit. Should be interesting. Let's go. Now the one I've got here today is a NES brand, N-E-S-S, they're actually an Australian company designed and built in Australia, more specifically here in Sydney. So uh, this is the quantum sensor and it is, you know, a basic uh, per sensor. It's not one of those, uh, you can get like a dual uh, wavelength types that have uh, an additional uh, microwave sensor in addition to a uh, passive infrared detector, but this one just has the passive infrared detector. And if we open them up, they're pretty easy to uh, open up. There's not much in them at all. It's the uh, Quantum EXP, actually. And uh, and there's our board in there. There's not much in that at all. And they're very nicely designed. You can just pop out the board. Look, I love that screw down in there, little screw holder. And you just pop that out like that, and bang, that's it. There's our PCB. They've got three chips on there. Let's check it out. So what have we got on the board here? Well, it's pretty simple. We've got our 12 volt power in because uh, almost all, well, every alarm system I've ever seen uh, uses 12 volt to power all of the sensors and all the other peripherals and things like that. We've got our alarm, which is a normally uh, closed output. And uh, because uh, you want it to be normally closed and then when the alarm goes off, it actually breaks that and triggers the alarm. And it's got a tamper switch output as well, which is also normally closed when the uh, power is off. And there's the tamper switch right there. And if you take a look, you'll see that the case up here has this uh, matching tab here so that when it clips on there like that and goes in, this actually depresses that switch down. And if anyone tries to um, sneak in under the sensor and then pry it open and try and disable it that way, bingo, it sets off the alarm as well. But that's optional. You don't actually have to wire in the uh, tamper switch if you don't want to, but uh, you can certainly do that. That's why you'll get uh, multiple pair al alarm cables going to a sensor because not only do they provide power, but there's a uh, the, uh, uh, the sensor output as well, but for a tamper switch. So you might get a uh, four pair um, alarm cable or something like that, typically wired in. Anyway, we have our per sensor here, which we'll take a look at in detail, I'm sure. We have our uh, relay over here, which we'll also take a look in detail because the relay's actually quite important, believe it or not. We've got a couple of uh, jumper switches here. One is to disable the LED. There's the LED. If you don't want it to come on, it just shines through the front of the uh, case here with the uh, Fresnel lens, which is uh, basically, um, you know, it's not uh, transparent, but it, uh, the LED will, um, you will get a nice dim glow sort of, you know, around there. You might get a, a dim circle on there. We'll power it up later and see that. But the LED can shine through here. We've got a link for the number of pulse counts. So if you're getting issues with uh, things accidentally setting off the sensor, um, you can change the number of pulse counts from one to two or three to four pulses required to set off the alarm. And we'll go into those uh, pulses later. We've got a couple of electrolytic caps here and the circuitry on the bottom. Interestingly, if you have a look here at the electrolytic caps, these orange ones are rated at 105 degrees C. Why? Well, probably for reliability because the higher temperature rated uh, ones have a longer lifespan at any given specific temperature and reliability in these things, as we'll go into with the uh, read relay, is incredibly important. And these ones here are only 85 
degrees C. I'm not sure uh, why they decided to do that. They're the same brand. They're a Hitano uh, brand. Not one of the biggest, but uh, certainly not really a one hung low either. And the circuitry on the back here is all analog. I love it. Um, we've got uh, the power supply here, which is an LM7805. Uh, You'd be familiar with that, five volt voltage regulator. We've got an LM339 uh, quad comparator. We've got an LM324 dual op amp. And uh, we've got a drive-in transistor over here for the relay. And that's, um, and a whole bunch of uh, passives, of course, uh, resistors and capacitors. But that's all there is to it. And the normally closed nature of these relays is quite uh, smart, of course, because then most of the time, uh, you know, if you're not home or something like that, there's no movement. So why energize the relay and waste the power, especially um, if the, uh, you know, if the power's been uh, lost or something like that and your alarm's operating from, from the battery backup. Anyway, you don't want to chew uh, the power unless it detects movement. So they have a normally closed contact there. Now the relay used in this one actually doesn't have any uh, brand and it does have uh, numbers marked on it but uh, you know you google those and I can't find a damn thing but anyway this will be an ultra high reliability uh, hermetically sealed read relay because these things have need a massive switch in life in the order of many millions. One of these relays might typically be rated for uh, five or 10 million or at least a million operations. Why? Well, you do the math. Every time you see, if you've got an alarm sensor at home, you can sit there all day and count the number of times every time that LED turns on, well, that relay means it's detected motion and the relay is switching. So, um, you know, if you do that, it'll be many hundreds of times. If you're in the kitchen or something, you're moving around, you're cooking, you've got the alarm sensor up in the corner and it's just going flash, 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 flash. And it might do that many hundreds of times, even maybe even thousands of times uh, per day. But let's take a figure of say 500 per day multiply that by 365 days in a year and you know you're over 180,000 relay operations per year and these sort of uh, sensors need or are designed for a very uh, long installed lifespan typically 10 years plus so you're talking you know over 10 years that might be 1.8 million operations or over a million operations so really you're going to need that relay to have like a million operations minimum. So um, a lot of the cost in this thing, most of the cost in this thing is probably the uh, per sensor itself, maybe the uh, Fresnel lens, although you could probably churn those out cheaply. We'll have a look at that and the Reed Relay. Now I think traditionally they've used uh, mercury wetted contacts in this, but this one specifically is advertised in the data sheet for this uh, product as having a uh, dry contact relay. So we know it's not a mercury wetted type. And if we have a close up look at our per sensor here you can see it's a pki inc uh, lhi968 pki inc is perkins elmer so let's go check out data sheet for this thing and here it is the perkin elmer lhi968 and this is definitely not a one hung low brand uh, sensor this is one of the best ones on the market and uh, because it comes from a this uh, alarm sensor comes from Ness it's a quality manufacturer and they put the best sensors into this thing as designed for here it is intrusion alarms high-end motion sensors not the cheapos it's a to5 metal can housing which is what we see it's got uh, uh, improved EMI protection and uh, let's and it's also got uh, optional white light uh, improvement as well it says they uh, grade it for lower white light sensitivity for interference from uh you know sunlight coming through the uh window and things like that if you're using it in an alarm scenario anyway this is what is inside one of these things there's an optical filter up here and of course that's the front filter it's actually uh dual windows as we'll see over here if you look at the diagram of this thing it's got two little windows in there and we'll take a look at why that's important in a second now it's got two different windows and two separate sensor elements inside and they're placed in series and you'll notice that the polarity is back to back positive on the uh, negative on the top positive there and positive on the bottom and this one's positive on the top negative on the bottom and that means that they can cancel 
each other out. So if it's in a room with uh, that there's no movement at all and it's they're all at thermal equilibrium and stuff like that, the sensors, uh, the sensors receive the uh, same amount of heat energy and they cancel each other out and there's no voltage generated. But when uh, the heat source, i.e. the human being, walks across, then uh, the reason it they have two different uh, sensor elements because then you can actually detect movement through, from one through to the other or vice versa and it can generate that positive or negative uh, voltage depending on which way it actually, um, uh, you know, with, which uh, the direction of the movement. If it's down like this, it'll generate a voltage in one direction. If it moves through up through these sensors, it'll generate a voltage in the other direction. And uh, there's a gate resistor on here, there's a JFET here, and it's just a source follower, that's all it is. There's a built-in resistor and the external circuit, as we'll take a look at, will have a will have a pull-up resistor on the drain and the source, because it's a source follower, the voltage input will equal the voltage output, but it's converting the very high impedance um, sensor voltage into a low impedance output and that will go into the uh, op-amp amplifier and that's all there is to it. There's some uh, uh, pyroelectric element sensors which are sensitive to a specific uh, wavelength, a specific uh, heat wavelength and a JFET. And the data sheet has some basic information on uh, how these infrared or pyroelectric sensors work and we've got some infrared basics here and we'll take a quick look at it but basically every uh, every everything, every body um, emits infrared radiation or heat uh, radiation. And they give an example here, a human body of a surface temperature of approximately 35 degrees C or 308 degrees Kelvin. You know, scientists like to work in Kelvin on this degree C rubbish. It gives a peak wavelength of 9.4 micrometers and a cat at 38 degrees. Pesky little cats. Urgh, I hate cats. Sorry, dog person. Uh, temperature gives, uh, they give out uh, a wavelength of 9.3 micrometers. So um, according to uh, uh, Planck, they've got um, a, they're going to have a radiated uh, emission, um, which is quite broad over the spectrum. So you can't really detect between a cat or a dog or a pet or something like that and a human with these uh, sensors, although some of these human, uh, some of these sensors, sorry, have been uh, tweaked to, to be pet aware. And if you have a look at this uh, graph of radiated energy on the y-axis versus the wavelength on the uh, x-axis, you can see the curves for different types of things. There's 32 degree human skin is the uh, is that green one in there, and you can see how broad it is. So. Uh, if you're going and uh, let's say, well, a you know, a, a something, an object that's at, that's at 10 degrees Celsius, for example, like the room uh, itself. If it, you know, in the middle of winter, it gets down quite low. There's the brown one down there. But as you can see, it's quite a broad uh, curve like that. So the infrared filter you use um, to actually get a narrow band of energy into your sensor, because the um, sensor you can't just have it absorbing and uh, actually detecting all uh, spectra or wavelengths of radiation. Otherwise, you'd be getting noise left, right and center caused by all sorts of stuff. So you want an infrared filter on the front to try and get that, you know, a narrow band in there, which um, is going to detect human movement. And of course, that infrared filter is pretty uh, critical to the uh, white light uh, immunity that uh, this sensor has or you know most of these good sensors should actually have because you don't want them picking up uh, the white light which comes in the window from the sun if you go out set your alarm you left your window open you didn't close your curtains as the sun goes across the sky it might uh, trigger at say 2 p.m. every day because it got just the right angle and boom it picked it up it'll be going off you know all day every day it'll be hopeless um, so you've got to have the infrared filter in there. They tell you like a long range uh, pyrometric filter like is used in uh, this one is uh, going to have a very narrow window of 9 to 14 uh, micrometers and here they tell us exactly how a pyroelectric uh, detector 
actually works or their ones actually work and they use a property of the ferroelectric dielectric material that they actually use and uh, basically when it uh, you apply thermal energy to it it uh, changes the electrical polarization and with that you can actually get a charge displacement and you get a voltage generated and you can convert that basically what the uh, pyroelectric material it uh, does is it forms a capacitor and that's why down in the circuit down here you can see that the sensor element is actually the symbol for a capacitor with the dielectric material in there and it's you know x number of picofarads or or whatever and that actually generates a voltage when you apply a specific thermal energy to it and of course there's a gate resistor in here and an RC that will form an RC time constant of approximately in this particular these particular sensors of about one second so they only detect very slow changing thermal energy and that's what you want you don't want to be picking up a very wide bandwidth because people only move very slowly in front of these sensors and here in the detector construction part it actually um, hints that these things are fairly sensitive to thermal and mechanical uh, noises and issues so um, the they mount the sensor inside in a special way that it avoids uh, thermal that provides thermal and mechanical uh, isolation from the case which is then hard mounted onto your PCB and things like that so if you hard mount the sensor onto your PCB and then your PCB is hard mounted to the case and the case is mounted to the wall and you get vibration on the wall well you know you want to uh, you want to, your alarm sensor to, to be immune to that. So these sensors, they're constructed in a special way where that doesn't happen. Now, if we look at another aspect of these sensors is the responsivity. And that actually uh, shows a bandpass characteristic here. And the y-axis is the uh, response in kilovolts per watt of uh, infrared energy coming in versus frequency on the x-axis here and you can see down at uh, 10 millihertz uh, there it you know it it peaks it peaks at around about you know point uh, one five hertz or thereabouts but it has a response a reasonable uh, response there from you know 10 millihertz up to a couple of hertz but it still has you know it drops off below uh, the one point there down to uh, you know 10 hertz so they're gonna be used within that sort of range and really that's what you're talking about when you're talking about detecting human movement through these sensors so that's why if you've seen like the uh, Mythbusters episode where they test these sensors and how slowly you have to move uh, through them not to be detected by them it's you know it's next to impossible because um, you know they've got a bandwidth which goes right down to uh, you know 0.0 01 hertz and beyond that I don't know whether or not that it, I, I would presume that would drop off you know fairly slowly like that on the other side but you would have to move incredibly slowly through these things not to be detected and also if you remember the circuit for this thing um, it has a high value resistor from the gate down to ground and of course high value resistors what do they generate they generate thermal noise or what's called Johnson noise and uh, that can be a real issue so um, they also have another graph here which is the responsivity of noise versus frequency and it's got the noise in microvolts RMS per square root of Hertz and that actually rolls off at the high frequencies and it has a natural roll off at the high frequencies as well and that's designed so that you know there's a delicate balance in there so that uh, the noise introduced from not only the uh, sensor but the um, and, and the FET itself but also that resistor on the input doesn't cause false triggering and just as an aside uh, Perkins Elmer also do a what's called a digi pyro and that's a instead of being an analog uh, pyroelectric sensor it's actually a complete digital one it's got the pyro elements down here just as we've seen but it's got an analog to digital converter it's got a decimator and a serial interface which goes off to a microcontroller and a voltage reference of course and an oscillator so these are completely digital uh, paths but they're uh, totally different systems to what we're looking at here today we're looking at the one which is analog only and if you have a look at uh, the rest of the specs on the table here for the LHI 968 you can see the responsivity we've mentioned the minimum the typical figure uh, matching between the uh, two different sensors 10% and the noise we've talked about the spectral detectivity and all sorts of fun 
stuff you can get into if you want some good uh, bedtime reading. Look up exactly, you know, the physics behind how all these sorts of things work. And uh, and also, um, it's got a field of view also of 100 degrees. So that's, you know, it's, it's not huge, but it's uh, reasonably wide. And that allows our uh, Fresnel lens to uh, focus into these things. So let's take a look at the Fresnel lens. And if we have a look at a website called glowlab.com, they've got uh, some interesting information on how the infrared motion detectors worked. And they've got some really good diagrams. So we'll take a look at these quickly. We've got the typical configuration here, which we've seen before. We've got our, uh, our IR per sensor here, dual elements inside there. It's got the IR filter on the front, as we've seen. It's got the JFET, it's got the gate resistor to ground, and then it's got an amplifier and a comparator. And there's a Fresnel lens in front of that to actually uh, focus various streams of energy. Uh, we'll take a look at that and the thermal energy coming in. And here's a nice little uh, diagram. We've got ourselves an animal here. I don't know what that is. It's got little antlers there. Isn't it cute? And basically, we've got the two uh, window, the, the two detector windows on our pyroelectric per sensor here, and that effectively gives you two different zones. And when your animal or your human walks through these different zones, you get two, well, they call them infrared source movements. The first one there, when it moves through the first one, it'll generate a positive output. And you remember the other one was uh, in series, but it was in the, but it was opposite polarity, so you'll get a negative going output like that and when it detects these it can actually detect that as a pulse count and we saw that jumper link in there for pulse counts and it can detect x number of pulse counts due to the uh, fresnel lens effect and bingo it triggers the relay and uh and your alarm goes off wah 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 intruder it's got antlers and here you go, it explains that a Fresnel lens, they pronounce it Fresnel, I don't know, I always call it Fresnel, is a plano convex lens. If you know your lenses and your optics and things like that, you're probably uh, going berserk right about now. And a Fresnel lens has the same uh, properties as this, but it's compressed into a thinner shape like this. So it retains the optical characteristics, but it's smaller in thickness, and then it doesn't have the absorption losses of a huge, big round lens like that and basically a uh, fresnel uh, lens a an alarm sensor lens will actually have multiple fresnel lens in it focusing different zones onto the ir element so let's actually take a look at the lens in our nest sensor now this might be a bit hard to see but if you take a look inside the front surface of this uh, sensor case you can see the individual concentric circle Fresnel lenses in there and these are all different zones and they've got two of them and they will be focused on the different um, the the two different sensors inside your per sensor and that will give you coverage right across the room spanning from one side to the other and you'll have two different focused sensors at each point in the room it's rather quite neat and novel I love it so this lens here actually has multiple concentric circle Fresnel lenses all the way across in patterns across this lens like this. So that's why it detects those different zones actually coming out of the sensor like that. And as you walk across, bang, you go from one zone to the other and it can more readily detect that and that helps the sensor uh, work a lot. So these things Really, um, the Fresnel lens is one of the keys to making these things work. Sure, you've got your uh, dual uh, sensor per in there, but without a good Fresnel lens to detect all those zones, you don't get that whole room, very difficult to get that whole room coverage, which these things, these per element sensors do really well. And this um, particular Nest sensor will do like uh, 12 metres by 12 metres square area coverage. It's quite large. And you can see that on the data sheet for the Nest Quantum EX sensor here. It's got 12 meters by 12 meters uh, coverage range. And you can see that the different, you can see that there's dual lines here. And that would represent the dual sensors in all these zones, which go across in patterns like this. So you can walk through this one over here, bang, it detects you. You can walk through this little zone over here, bang, it detects you. So you don't actually have to walk from one side 
all the way to the other side of the sensor to actually be caught by this thing. You only have to walk through one of these little individual zones here. So it's rather quite clever how these things work. I love it. And of course, you've got uh, different angles as well. They, you also have different angles on the lenses and different mounting angles for the sensor that allow uh, coverage over a certain depth with all these zones. So they really, that's why they're almost impossible to avoid these things, regardless of, you know, you might have a door over here, for example, and you walk through the door and you get detected. It's not because you're walking into the sensor, it's because there's slight differences between these two zones, and it'll catch you anywhere in any one of these zones. Look out. Well, I think it's about time we reverse engineered this circuit and see how it works. And bingo, here's the circuit I reverse engineered. And yes, it's a bit of a mess because that's what happens when you do this kind of thing. Um, you would, I'd have to redraw this to make it a bit more um, understandable, but uh, the front end here is actually identical to the circuit on the uh, glowlab.com website. So it looks like they're, like they're all uh, very similar circuits here. We've got our uh, per sensor with a pull down resistor, a filter here, and we've got uh, some comparators with some more filtering here going into a dual monostable. Well, we don't have this mono in which the monostable then drives uh, transistor, which drives the relay. Well, on this one, we don't have a dual monostable at all. We don't have any sort of, we don't have a monostable, but they're using uh, four, four of the comparators. They're using all four comparators inside once again there's a window detector there and um, so yeah it is uh, slightly different on the second half of the circuit here this second half of the circuit here is uh, slightly different but the front end is pretty much the same and yeah i won't go into details i think i'll leave that for another video where we might uh, possibly probe some waveforms and things like that so there you go i hope you enjoyed teardown tuesday and remember if you like teardown tuesday give it a big thumbs up on YouTube. That really helps a lot. Catch you next time.